Thank you so much, Pamela. It is really a pr pleasure and a privilege to talk to you this evening on a subject that has enthralled me for the better part of three years, Paul Cezanne's life companion, Hortense Fiquet, known at the Met as Madame Cezanne. We can scarcely document the woman who posed for Paul Cezanne for 25 years, who bore him a son, and whose mesmerizing portraits constitute a pivotal moment in the history of French portraiture. A few letters and postcards have surfaced in the course of our research, but in the main, Hortense Fiquet remains very much a mystery. The mythology of her persona is populated with the negative remarks of Cezanne's friends and admirers, his biographers and art historians right through the 20th century. The most one could wish for in these derisive writings is the admission that she had no distracting impact on her husband's advancing career. Indeed, many of Cezanne's contemporaries kept a watchful eye that Hortense Fiquet, her excursions to Switzerland and her profligate spending habits would not interrupt his painting. As recently as the 1990s, John Rewald confessed relief that Hortense Fiquet was of no real consequence to Paul Cezanne. I quote, Cezanne's marriage produced no change in his existence. Hortense's only contribution to her husband's life as an artist was in posing for him repeatedly without moving or talking. Cezanne rarely painted any other woman, and it must have entailed considerable sacrifice on the part of his lively and talkative wife to lend herself to the endless sittings he inflicted on her. When she occasionally attempted to participate in the discussion on art that Cezanne had with his friends, her husband would say to her in a quiet, reproachful voice, Hortense, be still, my dear. You are only talking nonsense. <laughs> I can only reply, I can only reply, John Rewald was misguided. In many respects, Hortense Fiquet was heaven sent. As Paul Cezanne's favorite model the, and the mother of his only son, charged with raising the young boy largely on her own, she was indispensable to him on many levels. Cooperative and acquiescent to the end, Hortense endured hours and hours of sitting in silence in makeshift studios as Cezanne rigorously advanced his practice. As you know, the artist worked slowly from perception with a blinding intensity. He moved often, setting up student studios in cramped Paris apartments in the early years and later in the villages surrounding Aix-en-Provence. Aix was his cherished birthplace, where he returned again and again to the comforts of home, a family estate known as the Jazz du Buffon. There Cezanne was welcomed without his life companion. For the first 17 years of their liaison, he refused to acknowledge her existence in family circumstances. His mother knew all, but his father was not formally told of the relationship until Hortense Fiquet walked down the aisle in 1886, only months before the grand patron died of old age. By then, young Paul was a growing adolescent, and his artist father likely married Hortense to formalize his inheritance. In fairness to Paul Cezanne, life had, done, had not done him many favors. His painting submissions to the official Paris Salon were repeatedly rejected for almost 20 years from 1864 onwards. Fellow artists understood his growing genius, but critics, even intimate friends like Emile Zola, repu repudiated Cezanne's aesthetic and expressed fr frustration that he was just wasting his time. Quote, Paul may have had the genius of a great painter, but he'll never have the genius to become one, wrote Zola. Cezanne's personal life was not without its trials. While he may not have been living with Hortense and young Paul much of the time, he felt a profound loyalty to provide for them financially. This meant sharing a monthly allowance doled out by his formidable father, who had no admitted understanding of the subterfuge at play. 200 francs was to sustain a family of three, living mostly apart and with no secondary income. Cezanne often turned to his childhood friend, the prosperous and enterprising Zola, begging for a bit more cash for Hortense. Quote, here is my monthly prayer to you recommencing, he, Cezanne wrote in 1878. I do hope it does not weary you too much, 
but your offer saves me so much embarrassment that I am having recourse to it again. My good family, otherwise excellent, is for an unhappy painter who has never been able to achieve anything, perhaps a little bit mean, a slight failing, and easily excusable in the provinces. I'm asking you to be kind enough to send 60 francs to Hortense, who, by the way, is feeling no worse." End quote. So it is against this background that we come to look at the portraits, their model and maker, their nuanced technique, and their implications, both personal and art historical. The memory of Hortense Fiquet may have dimmed over time, but the legacy of her presence in paint on canvas continues to resonate. Indeed, one might posit that Cezanne, not Picasso, set the stage for modern portraiture as we know it. So much that we take for granted today in the visual language of portraiture was unheard of in the later years of the 19th century. Yes, of course, the Impressionists shook up the canon, posing their wives in scenes of everyday life, but no artist had so demonstrably sidestepped the age-old expectations of the portrait canon. Flatter your subject, reference her inner life, add a few ornamental accessories, and satisfy the patron. To be quite honest, Cezanne's paintings of Hortense Fiquet were not portraits at all. They were figure paintings with a familiar protagonist, paintings about the experience of painting and the quiet hold of an accessible subject. Put succinctly in our catalog, quote, these are quietly explosive paintings about painting with Hortense Fiquet as catalyst. Paul Cezanne met Hortense Fiquet in Paris in 1869 when she was just 19. We think she was working as a bookbinder at the time alongside her father, who had recently moved his family to Paris from the Jura, hoping for a better life. We don't know when Hortense started modeling for Cezanne, but several charming portraits document her new role as early as 1872, the year young Paul was born. There is a self-consciousness to the young Hortense in early paintings and a relative conservatism to the brushwork that will soon evolve. For the next 20 years, Cezanne would paint Hortense Fiquet almost always indoors, sometimes in a recognizable interior, sometimes as a simple bus length frontal study. The 29 paintings that resulted from, Hortense, from, from Cezanne's intensive investigation vary greatly in scale, ambition, and finish. Some have been extensively reworked, while others were painted with minimal adjustments. The early portraits were thickly painted with a blunt square end brush, while the paintings of the 1880s onwards were much more thinly brushed and their mark making more variegated. The degree to which Cezanne finishes these portraits is a narrative unto itself. What might appear unfinished to the conventional eye is otherwise to Paul Cezanne. He brought his canvases to a level of completion that satisfied him and then he stopped painting. There's no better example of this approach than in the Met's magnificent portrait of Madame Cezanne in the conservatory. It is the last of the portraits painted in the conservatory of the Cezanne family house, the Jazz de Buffon in Aix. Young Paul Cezanne, young Paul Cezanne son of the artist, told Amboise Vollard that he remembered his mother posing there in the conservatory. Young Paul dated the back of a photograph of the picture, 1891. It's one of the few documents we have uh, actually, that actually confirms a date for these pictures. So the artist, so, the, so did the artist take this portrait to a state of, of completion, satisfactory to himself, and then stop painting? Never mind that the brushwork is just that in the lower reaches of the canvas, messy, energetic strokes that dematerialize the ultramarine dress so carefully contoured elsewhere. Our painting conservator, Charlotte Hale, undertook an extensive examination of this canvas preparatory to my exhibition. She looked at the painting in x-rays and in infrared photographs. These images expose Cezanne's technique, rigorous at the outset and open-ended as the picture progressed. It's worth pausing to consider his process. On a white ground, he laid in his composition in an underdrawing of Conte crayon or soft graphite. Infrared imaging reveals the underdrawing of the figure as he intended to position it in space. You will note the unfinished hands and the registration marks that lay in the head and placement of the facial features. Rather than using hard contours to scaffold his figure in space, Cezanne uses freely drawn lines, allowing him to build form incrementally as he applied color. <laughs> 
Cezanne perceives structure in terms of color relationships. Quote, I take these colors, tones, shades from the right, the left, here, there, everywhere. I fix them, I bring them together, end quote. Cezanne worked slowly, intensively, holistically, translating his sensation, the sensory experience of what he was seeing, into material equivalents on canvas. And I stress the word seeing, for he always worked perceptually, what he repeatedly referred to as painting from nature. He once told Joachim Gasquet, quote, my eyes, you know, my wife tells me that they jump out of my head. They get all bloodshot, end quote. It is hard to overstate the degree of rigor and concentration with which the artist studied his model. Returning to his model in the conservatory, having established the underdrawing, Cezanne began painting with muted washes of oil thinned with turpentine, seen pooled at the bottom of Hortense's dress. He then added colors mixed with white to achieve opacity, as in the flesh tones of the face. In the upper part of the dress, we can track his thin, cumulative applications of ultramarine and lead white, modulated with vermilion red and viridian green. Through X-ray and infrared images, we can trace Cezanne's process, his adjustments as he brought balance to the whole. The wall behind Hortense was originally flatter. The plant to her right was larger and a flower pot stood to the left of her head. The head was initially softer and more naturally modeled. When Cezanne eliminated the now familiar central part of her hair, painting a continuous arc around her forehead, he essentially nested one oval in another, introducing a level of abstraction to an otherwise classically beautiful face. Of course, the degree of finish in this portrait has been debated for years, its technique and brushwork a rich tapestry of marks, from the highly worked face fluidly smooth to the barely articulated skirt, wall, and foliage in the bottom right quadrant. The spiraling brushwork is just a tease, announcing its mark with no imagistic attachment. There is no doubt that Paul Cezanne signed off on this magisterial picture as is. It went to Volar's gallery soon after completion, and it was bought immediately by the great Moscow collector, Ivan Marasov. Questions of finish arrive elsewhere in the many portraits of Hortense Fiquet. Take, for example, this exquisite small picture in a private collection in Switzerland, perhaps the most abstract of all the portraits. Its airless silence and the sitter's downcast eyes are deeply affecting. Remember that this figure study was painted around 1877, at least 30 years before modernism embraced figural abstraction. I mentioned the painting in the context of finish because its current framing exposes the entire canvas. The bottom edge and right edge are unfinished. Do you imagine that Paul Cezanne intended to leave exposed ground in an image that was otherwise precisely calibrated? I don't think so. This was actually the choice of the collectors. They, mentioned they were very proud of their new framing. <laughs> the little painting may once have shared a length of canvas with other small pictures in process. Pencil lines appear on two sides of the composition, delimiting its boundaries. History tells us that Cezanne would often give the color merchant, Julian Tanguy, large canvases to cut up for buyers of modest means. Tanguy displayed works by Cezanne, Van Gogh, and other struggling artists which he took on consignment in exchange for canvases and paints. Tanguy's shop was Cezanne's only commercial outlet until the enterprising Amboise Volard gave Cezanne his first serious exhibition in 1895. There's actually a still life of apples in the Metz collection that illustrates the artist's idiosyncratic habit of combining two separate studies on the same length of canvas. The brownish tone at the lower left and along the right edge may have been added by Volar himself, consolidating two unrelated still lifes to aggrandize value. Volar sold the still life as you see it to Vuillard in exchange for one of Vuillard's own works. I'm frequently asked why the arrangement of por portraits in my exhibition does not follow a logical chronology. Well, there are many arguments, the first being that Cezanne's subject never ages. Her facial expression and bearing vary from canvas to canvas, but verisimilitude was not the artist's brief. 
Secondly, some dates are quite speculative. Cezanne painted very, very slowly. We know that his portraits often spanned several years, years of adjusting and refining. He was known to pause for as long as 20 minutes between brush strokes, admonishing his sitters to sit still when their patience lagged. We have a general idea of dating, but very little knowledge of the circumstances surrounding the portrait practice. With few exceptions, an apartment in Paris wallpapered with a lozenge pattern and the conservatory at the Jazz de Buffon, for example, we don't know where Hortense Fiquet posed, nor the duration and frequency of the sittings. Their sessions were private, very private. To preserve the subterfuge in the Cezanne family, Cezanne rarely shared housing with Hortense and young Paul. He spent a great deal of time worrying about money, begging friends to add funds to Hortense's meager allowance, and convincing his father that any suspicion he might have of the presence of a grandson was sheer nonsense. The final argument against any sort of chronological installation is by now quite obvious. Paul Cezanne was not really painting portraits. He was painting heads and a figure in space, an image he knew well, an image he could sketch out on canvas with ease before taking on another investigation of form in space. Late in life, Cezanne spoke of his colored sensory experiences, the sensation colorant, suggesting the active role of sensation in generating the experience of color. And I should add that the French word sensation does not really have an acceptable equivalent in English. The best we can do in translation is to think of it as sensory experience. Cezanne famously noted that he could only work from subjects, his motifs, that were closely familiar to him. Of course, this plays out in the landscapes and still life imagery as well. Working in the landscape shrouded by Mont Saint Victoire, Cezanne made at least 40 paintings of that mountain, admitting quite candidly that all he had to do was move a little to the left or a little to the right to see his subject anew. One cannot resist transposing that remark to our portraits of Hortense. See, for example, these appealing pictures so clearly related in time and costume the subtle brushwork in the sublime frontal portrait from the Bergruen collection in Berlin, a portrait whose brush brushwork is in, is in perfect pitch, according to Charlotte Hale, evolves to a more energetic handling in the second iteration from the Philadelphia Museum, where brushstrokes underscore the two-dimensionality of the picture plane. This late-stage brushwork blurring contours often distracts the eye in a wonderful way, privileging formal considerations over nature. Before we resume our, our, our study of the portraits in oil, I'd like to say a few words about Cezanne's drawing practice. Unlike the paintings over which he labored for years, his sketchbook drawings were informal and spontaneous. Cezanne often sketched in the evening after a day at the studio, catching Hortense re resting or even fully asleep. These random moments are intimately captured in pencil and paper, almost invariably drawn in small oblong sketchbooks. Many of the sketchbooks have since been disbound, but a few are intact, and we have three glorious examples in the exhibition. If any works of art can make a case for an affectionate environment, for reciprocal affection, it is these casual drawings, cameos of a life, spent together. You will note that Cezanne filled his sketchbook folios with all sorts of ideas, from the layout of a bather's composition to the crisp geometry of a milk jug. He spared no paper, and the results are a fascinating serendipitous assortment of motifs. Few of these studies made their way to oil on canvas, but indirectly they embodied ideas that would later coalesce in the studio. Much like the paintings, expression varies from one drawing to another, at times youth, youth, youthful, at times aging, usually inattentive to Cezanne's gaze, Hortense has an air of quiet, even resignation, in these beautifully crafted graphite studies. Much as Cezanne returned to his sketchbooks over time to add studies here and there, he remastered his canvases too. Take, for example, another portrait in the Philadelphia Museum. It is a picture of touching sensuality. In your mind's eye, imagine the paintbrush caressing creamy flesh tones into place as it crosses the bridge of Hortense's nose and transitions to gray-blue-green shadow. 
Cezanne used, certain, used, used curtain fabric as backdrops in numerous paintings, most famously actually in the Met's own Madame Cezanne in a red dress, which we'll take a look at later. Here the curtain device is rather perplexing. Indeed, something else is at play. Turning the canvas 90 degrees, we see in infrared photographs that the flowers and leaves of the bouquet follow the contours of a figure previously drawn on the canvas and then abandoned. Only a section of the head and proper right shoulder are visible. The rest have been cut away by the artist when he resized and reoriented the canvas for the present portrait. As Charlotte Hale has noted in her study of this painterly metamorphosis, the original figure, who may well have been Hortense, transitions to a bouquet of flowers and then into this odd, unreadable framing device that crowns the final portrait. Ambiguities of structure and motif appear in other portraits, but, none, but in none is there a vestige of some previous effort so prominently articulated. I have been asked how I managed to assemble so many of the portraits. Well, in fact, a few great portraits got away, and one is worth a virtual visit, if only to trace its itinerary through the 20th century. <clears throat> this magisterial portrait formed part of an illustrious art collection of Gertrude Stein. At the onset of World War II, facing the imminent German occupation of Paris, Gertrude and Alice Toklas decamped to a small village in Vichy to sit out the war. Leaving Paris in great haste, Gertrude packed her two favorite portraits, that of Madame Cezanne and Picasso's now iconic portrait of Stein herself. When the war dragged on and money was scarce, Gertrude was obliged to sell Madame Cezanne to generate some ready cash. The portrait found its way to Switzerland, where it now resides in the Berla collection in Zurich. Cezanne first worked on the canvas for several years, around 1880, and then returned to it to modify it six to eight years later. Alas, we would have relished the chance to photograph it using an infrared camera, broadening our understanding of Cezanne's motivation to re-enter the painting years after he first abandoned it. Well, you're probably wondering why the loan was refused. In 1992, a selection of the Berla collection traveled to various museums, among them the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. The press at the time did not react kindly to the news that the collection of a former arms dealer, Emile George Berla, was being so honored. It is said that he supplied arms to the Germans during the war. The incendiary remarks in the U.S. press called, caused Berla's daughter to call a moratorium on loans to the United States and that censorship still holds. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that fellow artists embraced Cezanne's aesthetic long before the Parisian dealers and collectors would take a chance on this, quote, eccentric painter. Henri Matisse came to admire Cezanne in the early years of the last century when he, Matisse, favored portraiture over still life and landscape painting. Madame Matisse was the artist's regular model in those years, presiding, as Hilary Sperling will tell you, over almost all of Matisse's most radical canvases. When Matisse exhibited a portrait of Amélie entitled Woman with a Hat in the Salon of 1905, the critics and public were outraged. Henri Matisse eventually owned the graceful portrait of Madame Cézanne, now in the Musée d'Orsay. We think he may have owned another for a short time as well, but documentation is, is too scarce to draw conclusions here. An unsympathetic anecdote has found its way into our discussion, and I might as well pass it along. Henri Matisse sat next to Hortense Fiquet at a dinner with Jean Renoir just months before she died in 1922. Hortense is said to have told Matisse that her husband was an old fool who couldn't paint. Matisse... <laughs> Matisse dismissed her in return as humble, ignorant, and menial. Years later, writing to a friend, Matisse recounted that Madame Cezanne and Madame, P and Madame Pizarro were two women of simple background who served their husbands with their modest means and then judged their heroes as one might judge a simple carpenter who had taken it into his head to construct tables with legs in the air. <clears throat> Of all the mysteries surrounding Hortense Fiquet and Paul Cezanne, their 37 years together and the affecting portraits that speak to their physical intimacy, we have very little knowledge of the circumstances under, under which many of these portraits were painted. 
Cezanne's biographers rarely distinguish between his living quarters and his working spaces, and more often than not, in financially strapped circumstances, the two were one and the same. Until Cezanne built his glorious studio at Les Louvres, set on a hillside, then to the north of Aix-en-Provence, his makeshift arrangements took him from cramped, noisy lodgings to studios shared with other artists to rural farm buildings in the south. We have a record of several Paris apartments, one of which doubled as a studio for several of Cezanne's finest paintings. A beautiful portrait of Madame Cezanne now in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, another in Stockholm, and several exquisite still lifes. The apartment at 67 Rue de l'Ouest in the Montparnasse area of Paris was distinctive for its pale green and blue lozenge patterned wallpaper. Deserving every bit of its celebrity, the Boston portrait caught the eye of the poet Rainer Maria Rilke at the Salon d'Automne in 1907, the year after Cezanne died. The painting was one of 56 shown in a retrospective honoring the artist's memory. Rilke was exultant in a poignant letter to his wife, truly overcome with emotion. Quote, and already, as I'm leaving it, on the way home for the last time, I want to go back to look up violet, a green, or certain blue tones, which I believe I should have seen better, more unforgettably, already, even after standing with such unremitting attention in front of the great color scheme of the woman in the red armchair, it is becoming as irretrievable in my memory as a figure with many digits. And yet I memorized it, digit by digit, in my feeling, the consciousness of their presence has become a heightening, which I can feel even in my sleep. My blood describes it in, within me." End quote. Rilke was particularly impressed by the, quote, equilibrium he found in Cezanne, by the, quote, painterly equivalence of the object, and, quote, a final and definitive picture existence. On a lighter note, he described the vanity of female visitors who first admired themselves in the glass doors at the entrance to the salon, before sitting in front of the portraits of Madame Cezanne, disdaining the painted images in self-referential pleasure. The death of the family patriarch, Louis Auguste Cezanne, in 1886, changed the artist's financial circumstances. He would forever afterwards have the means to upgrade his living and working quarters, culminating in the studio he built at Les Louvres in 1902. We know that by the end of 1888, he was renting an apartment in Paris at 15 Quai d'Anjou on the picturesque Ile Saint-Louis and renting a studio <clears throat> on the left bank near the Luxembourg Gardens. As Mary Tompkins Lewis has noted in her fine essay on Cezanne's studios, having real working space for the first time prompted new aesthetic investigations. There's no better proof of that argument than the Met's Madame Cezanne in a red dress its ambitious spatial construction from the sloping wainscoting to the hard edge mirror frame and stone mantel to the sitter leaning in as if, to, as if to defy her support, all are disjunctive and unsettling in an alluring way. The Met portrait is one of four in a suite of paintings posing Hortense in the same red dress. In three of the four, she sits in the same yellow brocade chair you will have noted by now that our protagonist is almost always anchored in space by her many portraits. <clears throat> Even the bus link studies evidence the back of a chair. This observation makes it all the more puzzling that the red dress painting from Brazil has no surrounding elements. She is purely figure ground. She is purely a figure ground exercise. The four portraits have been reunited in the exhibition for the first time since they left the artist's studio. Having them side by side provides an unprecedented opportunity to look at the artist's process in closely related works painted within a limited time period between 1888 and 1890. There's no consensus on the order in which they were painted, but it's generally agreed that the Metz picture, the largest and most ambitious portrait of Hortense Viquet, came last. It is fair to say that one work led to another in this magnificent suite culminating in the powerful final interior. The red dress portrait seemed to divide into pairs, Basel and Chicago on the one hand, and Sao Paulo and the Met on the other. So why this fascination with Hortense in a red dress? Cezanne is famously quoted in a letter from Camille Pizarro to his son Lucien as saying, only I know how to paint red. 
Charlotte Hale has written insightfully on these four portraits in our catalog, linking them in time through an analysis of methodology. The Basel painting appears to have been painted relatively quickly and directly. There is, ev there is extensive painting wet in wet in the face. Much of the brush underdrawing and underpaint is visible, as are areas of unpainted white ground. And incidentally, you will note unpainted white ground is visible in many of the portraits, as in this portrait from the Orangerie, where he uses white ground to capture light in her costume. In the Basel portrait, there is evidence that Cezanne went back into the portrait after its paint had dried, adding the highlight on the chair that interrupts its pattern and adjusting the black band above the wainscoting, now, hi now higher at left than at right. While the Chicago portrait may appear to reprise the pose and expression of the Basel picture, it deviates in its adjustments, certainly in the head. The sitter looks distantly here. Infrared imaging and x-rays tell us that the more naturalistic appearance of Hortense, seen in the underlayers, was later altered. Cezanne narrowed the eyes by painting over the eyelids. Strokes of pale paint were pulled up over the top lip and right side of her mouth the head now is far more stylized, less naturalistic than its counterpart. Its geometry supersedes any notion of expression. The Sao Paulo portrait, devoid of clues to its placement in space, is the most puzzling of the four. Colleagues have wondered if Hortense sat for this portrait to its conclusion. The brushwork laying in the background is already is another conundrum. Does it look like the marvelous agitated brushstrokes that we've seen in other portraits of Hortense? I'll let you arrive at your own conclusions once you visit the exhibition. Charlotte quite rightly contextualizes this picture as a figure study, perhaps painted with a plan to reprise it in a later work. Indeed, in pose and scale, the Sao Paulo and Met portraits coalesce. Cezanne has painted this casual portrait with fewer adjustments and finishing strokes. The dress takes center stage with its folds and inverted pockets protruding prominent, prominently. One wonders if the head was an afterthought. So you can see that Paul Cezanne put in his time before embarking on the last of the four red dress paintings. Of the 29 portraits, it is clearly the most daring structure, positioning its sitter squarely surrounded by the tilting geometry of its asymmetry. Hortense herself appears to lean to her left, discomfited in her awkward pose. The light side of her face has little in common with its shaded counterpart and the overall facial expression is as hard to parse as the incongruity of the surrounding interior. We know that Cezanne painted the face wet to wait, wet, fully confident after several dress rehearsals. It seems fitting to close this study with the Met's magisterial portrait on your screen, but before we do, I'd like to return to our protagonist, Hortense Fiquet Cezanne. We have come to know her anecdotally through her husband's life story Critics have derided her character and often ignored her portraits. The portraits of variable expression and affect are difficult and unrevealing. In the aggregate, they tell us relatively little about Cezanne's ties to Hortense Fiquet, neither as a model nor as life partner. Her painted likeness shifts from picture to picture, sometimes only negligibly. Cezanne seems to reinvent his model with each new canvas rectangle. Painted in a concentrated period, we wonder how the artist managed such a breadth of material given the force and finish of the canvases. Cezanne traveled restlessly, always to paint. Hortense was raising their son. Their liaison was clandestine. Money was scarce. We have a few affectionate salutations in letters from Cezanne to his son, but otherwise no real understanding of Cezanne's feelings for his life companion. As patient studio model, and quiet presence in so many extraordinary portraits, we do know that Hortense Fiquet Cezanne was central to Paul Cezanne's art making, and we know art making was his life's obsession. Thank you. Thank you.